Last weekend at the London Trans Pride March, Sarah Jane Baker, a violent male ex-con who identifies as a trans woman, took to the stage and said this. I was going to come here and be really fluffy and be really nice and say, yeah, be really lovely and queer and gay. No, if you see a <laughs> punch him in the <laughs> face. So, to discuss the apparent rise in violent activism, please welcome author and professor of criminology, Joe Phoenix. <laughs> Joe, that clip uh, went viral, obviously, for very good reason. One of the more, most disturbing aspects of that clip is not even so much what Sarah Jane Baker said from that podium about punching women in the face, but that it got a huge cheer yep. from the crowd. What's going on there? 100%. Uh, and, in fact, when I saw that, that was the first thing that struck me. Um, I mean, people like me and others have heard that sort of expletive and that sort of violence a million times before in the mm. last five years, sadly. Um, and I find what the most disturbing aspect was was precisely that whoop yeah. that went up afterwards. Um, but more than anything else, after that thing went viral, uh, we then had a complaint to the police, um, and they say, well, the police failed after the complaint was made. Not quite. The police failed... At that moment, um, there were policemen at the... the there were police there, there watching, were, the, watching this event. Precisely. Yes. And nobody said anything, nobody uh, did anything. Um, we have a couple of legal problems, which I don't want to dwell on, because I really want to talk about the reaction yes, to what's happened. Um, if you inhabit particular quarters of the, of, of the Twitter sphere, yes. uh, what we've seen on, if you like, the other side uh, is perhaps the most shocking and very disturbing normalization of violence against women that I've seen for a very long time. Well, there's a few things to unpack there. I mean, let's start with some of the responses have said, well, this kind of thing happens on both sides of the debate. The MP Clive Lewis mm -hmm. said that you hear this kind of thing on both sides. I have never, and I've watched and read an awful lot in this area, I've never seen a gender-critical feminist call for a trans person to be violently attacked, punched, in any way, yeah. anything like that. And if something were to happen like that at a Let Women Speak event, I don't think the crowd would cheer. I think they would stop that person from speaking. I think they'd be deeply shocked uh, yes. to begin with, uh, because we've all made a point. You know, it doesn't matter what sort of politics that you have within this movement, people have made a point to recognize uh, the rights of transgender individuals. Yes. Right? And that's, that's just how it is. But so you talked about the fact that uh, the MP said harm on both sides. Yes. Let me tell you a little bit about this. As a criminologist, we have something, a concept called techniques of neutralization. Now, techniques of neutralization are a series of rhetorical devices. So yeah. the way you reframe something so that you basically deny the harm that's being done. Right. Famously, a man called Stan Cohen wrote a book called States of Denial, which was all about how, how states um, deny the crimes that they do when they commit human atrocities. Right? And there are five techniques of neutralization. I just want to go through them because they're all present in what happened. Interesting. Um, so the very first one is denial of responsibility. Right? It wasn't my fault. Well, what we saw immediately from the trans pride organizers was we didn't invite, we didn't invite Baker. Yes. Um, that came as part of an open mic. Okay. Then the second thing that you have is a denial of harm. Well, it was just words, wasn't it really? Nobody was hurt. No one was really the, the object of it. Even though it, it is classified as incitement to violence. Uh, technically, technically, yes. but incitement to violence, you need to have it, an actual individual. Right, right. So that broad crowd thing is going to be a public gotcha. order offence. Yep, yep. um, so, yeah, they're going to say, well, it's just words. And actually, when Baker spoke then, Baker didn't actually mean it. So they okay. deny the harm. Then denial of the victim. That's the big one that we see here. Well, TERFs deserve it. And in fact, if you think about, again, from Twitter, there were a lot of trans rights activists who were reposting that picture of the Polish woman who tried to hit the Nazi with her handbag. Yes. Right? Saying, basically, you know, these aren't the real victims. We're the victims here. Yes. Right? So that's three techniques of neutralization. The fourth technique of neutralization is to condemn the condemners. Right? And, of course, we saw that in buckets and spades over the, the Twitter sphere, particularly with the trans rights activists, where they were saying, actually, this is righteous trans rage. Right? That's all Sarah Jane Baker was expressing, was righteous trans rage. And then the very final one is an appeal to higher loyalty. And that's where we are right now. 
the appeal to higher loyalty is, well, this was done in the name of the good. And in fact, what we see from, again, that particular part of Twitter is people talking about Sarah Jane Baker as a political prisoner. OK. Now, but there was also a response from uh, the young woman who glued herself to the floor when Kathleen Stock was speaking at the Oxford Union. She wrote a long thread sort of saying, I, I, she was saying, I don't justify violence or threats of violence, but what I'm saying is that we as a community are so under attack, subject to whatever, you know, phrases such as genocide has been used, <laughs> denying existence of trans people, all these incredibly hyperbolic phrases that have a complete disconnect with reality. Mm -hmm. But when people use those extreme phrases, then I suppose they can justify violence as a form of self-defense. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. But that's also part of the condemning the condemners. Gotcha. Right? And yeah. it's also part of the denial of responsibility. So it's not us. We're the ones under the attack. We're the real victims. Now, the thing about these techniques of neutralization is they're only ever used when the community that's using them know that what they're doing is incorrect. Yeah. Uh, right? Okay. You have to recognize it first to deny it second. That makes now, sense. which is a very interesting place to be at because, in fact, what we're seeing is that rhetoric that's basically saying, no, really, despite everything, it is okay to punch a woman in the face. But it doesn't work, does it? I mean, we've seen actual physical assaults at some of the Let Women Speak events organized by yeah. um, um, Posey Parker, yeah. uh, for uh, Kelly J. Keane, that is. For instance, in, uh, was it in Mel, not in Mel New Zealand? Yeah. And a 72 year old woman was punched in the face. Yeah. Uh, that was caught on camera. We've all seen it. And this does not endear anyone to these activists. No, thoughts. and of course it's not just, you know, things that happen in New Zealand. I can talk about an event that I was actually at at the beginning of February at the University College London, a, a, a UCL Women's Liberation WPUK conference. Um, and indeed, Sarah Jane Baker was there. Um, and the real toxicity of that is mm. that somebody like Sarah Jane Baker whips up the protesters. Yes. Right. So there's a clip that's making its way around uh, Twitter or did uh, where a young woman uh, was shouting expletives, that basically saying, you know, F you, get the F out of here and, yes. and all this very, very hot atmosphere. And then, of course, what happened later on that afternoon is the protesters broke free from their enclosure, if you like. Uh, they went to go find the ground floor and the basement floor where the women were meeting in rooms and they were literally baying and banging at the, the windows, right? Yes. Which, and again, is also quite aggressive. Um, but then afterwards, a woman was actually assaulted by one of the protesters. So, you know, we see this sort of violence happening all the time. And until and unless it's recognized as what it is, violence against women, right? Yes, perpetrated then, by men. Perpetrated by men, more often than not. Yes, um, but yeah. that's another interesting point, isn't it? It's insofar as this kind of aggressive, violent behaviour is far more common amongst men. I mean, the crime statistics reveal that <laughs> indisputably, and yet this is a group of people who are trying to say, but we're women like anyone else. Yeah. Well, surely yeah. that's undermining their own point, isn't it? Well, you'd think so, you'd think so, but of course, because they have an appeal to higher loyalty, yes. we're doing it in the name of trans rights, but how hard could it be for some of the prominent trans activists to say, we condemn all violence? You know, we see with the J.K. Rowling uh, situation where all of the death threats and rape threats are going one way. Mm -hmm. They're coming from extreme trans activists who, by the way, I don't think represent trans people as a whole I agree. at all. I agree. Um, they're a minority of very aggressive and violent people who are, I think, doing more harm than good yeah. to trans people. But we don't see it come the other way. We don't see gender critical feminists sending rape and death threats. That simply doesn't happen. Yeah. And everyone can see that. So why can't the activists say, look, we know you can see what's going on. Acknowledge reality, yeah. then acknowledge that, that, that violence is wrong, and then go from there. Ah, uh, well, that's a really interesting one. So there is somebody on Twitter, a trans rights activist, who has distanced themselves utterly from the, the sort of violent rhetoric. However, one of the reasons it becomes very difficult for them to distance themselves in the fashion that you're suggesting mm. is because then they'd have to confront that thing called male pattern offending. And they'd have to recognize that actually, even within their ranks, as in, you know, male people who identify as women, that we don't know and probably suspect that even though they identify as women, it doesn't override that historical pattern of male violence. Is that right? So the pattern is retained? We don't know. There's only been one proper study that's been done, and it's very, very small, and it's very local. Um, and that's one of the questions that we desperately need to ask. What is this relationship between gender identity yes. and biological sex? Because certainly in the area of crime, the sex patternation to offending is so great uh, as to be perhaps the only true fact we have in criminology.
OK, well, uh, there's an awful lot to go into here. I'm sure we'll have you back. Joe Phoenix, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you.